If you're a professional brewer, you know how frustrating it can be when you go to place a yeast order and what you're looking for is out of stock. Well, Imperial Yeast is here to help by guaranteeing that commercial orders up to 20 liters of 10, yes, 10 of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. Some of these strains include A38 Juice for those hazy IPAs, A07 Flagship, a classic in clean American styles, L13 Global, which is said to be one of the world's most popular lager strains, A44 Kviking for your warm fermented beers, and so many more. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping is on them. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. There's evidence to suggest that beer was initially stored in ceramic vessels, though as brewing knowledge progressed, wood became the material of choice, followed by glass, aluminum, and stainless steel. But as of relatively recently, those aren't the only options. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Will Lovell to chat about the impact storage in a PET keg has on beer, specifically a pale lager. So as long as I've been in home brewing, Marshall, um, what I remember is stainless steel as being the only option if you want to get into kegging. So it's really exciting that companies like Keglin have come on more recently and gotten into using other materials like polyurethane. Yeah, yeah. Like you, when I started kegging back in 2011, the only option I was aware of were these stainless steel corny kegs for homebrewers, at least. And on the commercial scale, that was Sankey kegs, which, again, they were all stainless steel. Uh, and I, at least that's what I'd seen up to that point. Now, since then, I've noticed an uptick in kegs made from different materials, one being PET, uh, which I think is super interesting. I'm looking forward to chatting about this with you today, Will, as well as an experiment you uh, you did comparing PET kegs to standard stainless cornies. All right. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and, an, and a monthly invite uh, to a Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month's guest is Clay Disney from Jaded Brewing, makers of some of the world's fastest immersion chillers. I've known Clay for almost as long as brewlosophy has been around. In fact, he was our very first real sponsor. And the fact he is still around is something we're incredibly grateful for. In addition to his expertise on chilling, Clay's just a fun dude who's sure to put on a great session. To be a part of it, you have to make your pledge of just $3 or more at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. No later than Friday, February 24th, 2023, is Clay's going to be taking questions that Saturday, the 25th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Huge cheers to all of the people who have decided to support us over at Patreon. It really does help. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really would appreciate that as well. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who in addition to having a remarkable YouTube channel chock full of great brewing related content, sell what we believe to be some of the best electric brewing systems on the market. If you've been considering making the move from propane to electric, you owe it to yourself to check out Claw Hammer Supply. Whether you're after a 120 volt five gallon unit or something bigger like their powerful 240 volt 10 gallon system, Claw Hammer has got you covered. Learn more about everything they have to offer at clawhammersupply.com and don't forget to check out their YouTube channel as well. Listener Mad Dog, that's a rad name, a professional brewer from the Bay Area of California, wrote in with some thoughts he had after listening to our recent episode on boiling wort in a covered kettle. He said, while I'm sure modern malts have a lot to do with the results, one thing I think sometimes gets missed is that the research done on brewing chemistry is often done on the professional scale, uh, which can give totally different results than a five-gallon batch. The bigger your system, the lower your surface area to volume ratio is in the kettle. It's totally possible the surface area to volume ratio in an eight-gallon kettle is just too big for SMM slash DMS to last through any boil. But in a 30-barrel kettle, it's much harder to get rid of volatile compounds due to the tiny relative surface area, so the problem becomes more relevant. I know you folks don't make explicit recommendations, but it's definitely something to consider before applying small-scale results to the large scale. Well, I, I don't think that we should take anything we do here and really just extrapolate all the way out to the pro level. Again, we're, we're home brewers, and in the same way that I don't expect home brewing systems to be the same, like three-vessel systems like pro brewers used, 
Um, I don't I don't need to handicap myself like that with my system. Like I, I understand that these results don't always scale up in that way. So this makes total sense to me. There is definitely a possibility, and and obviously Pro Brewers are the ones putting in the money for the research. Yeah, they well them and students at these research institutions, right? That that's what I think of all the time. I've got some friends. Cade is currently uh, up at the, the Oregon State University. He's in the brewing school with Tom Shell Shellhammer. My understanding is that a lot of the experiments actually do happen on the smaller scale for for kind of the same reasons it's it's economical uh to to experiment on smaller uh smaller batch sizes now that doesn't mean that they're not doing you know seven barrel batch uh you know experiments i'm sure that's happening as well but i absolutely understand what mad dog is saying and i have no doubt that some of the variables we've tested would be different if the experiment was performed on a larger scale is boiling in a covered kettle one of them i honestly cannot say in part because we haven't found a commercial brewer willing to test it out for us yet Uh, uh, but just based on what we've learned about the formation of DMS, uh, as well as the modern malts, you know, the impact that modern malts have on the whole process, I wouldn't be shocked if it didn't have that much of an effect. I get the pull to want to believe that there's something different there. And I agree with you, Will. Extrapolation is great when when there's a lot of backing behind whatever it is that, that the claim is. Uh, but to extrapolate from, you know, two five-gallon batches brewed in somebody's garage, which, you know, as good as clean as our process is, and I'm I'm proud of the way that we approach it. To say that that's exactly how it's always going to be on on no matter what your scale, no matter what your style, that's just a fallacy, and we're we're not pushing that. We never have. Uh, some people accidentally uh, interpret it that way, but you know, it also wouldn't surprise me if it did have an impact. Uh, it, you know, on the on the larger scale, I tend to lean toward modern, you know, modern well modified malts as being the reason DMS isn't as big of an issue these days. But I could be absolutely wrong, and that's okay. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Mad. Doug, hit me up with uh, the brewery you work at, and I'll try to swing by next time I'm in the Bay Area. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. Our YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show, is officially up and running, and we could not be more thrilled with the response it has received so far. If you're among uh, the many who enjoy watching your brewing content, head over to youtube.com slash at The Brewlosophy Show. That's the at symbol, The Brewlosophy with a regular U show. When we're back from this break, we'll be focusing on storing beer in PET kegs. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. There are a number of different vessels beer can be stored in, though for those who prefer packaging in bulk, the options are a bit more limited. In fact, I don't recall there being anything other than stainless kegs up until a few years ago when Kegland released their Oxbar PET keg. I think I'm saying that right. And as far as I can tell, they're really the only ones producing reusable plastic kegs. Uh, I did a little internet search. I did find that there are some what they call one-way uh, PET kegs that are they're just single-use, kind of like a soda bottle, uh, but it's a you know, like a two gallon keg for beer that once the beer is gone, you toss it. We're not going to be talking so much about that today, but these reusable PET kegs. Now, before we get into the details of PET kegs, let's spend some time just talking about kegging in general, Will. Uh, yeah, kegging is just the standard for packaging beer in bulk uh, that's going to be served on draft ultimately, right? And that's kind of 
you see that on commercial scale, homebrew scale. It's all kind of across the board. Uh, the still beer is transferred to the keg where it's typically forced carbonated, um, which requires the ability to maintain a pretty decent amount of pressure. Uh, I believe if you go to philosophy.com, there's a nice chart on uh, that Marshall created to kind of give you a ballpark <laughs> on, um, on on how to, how long to, to put it up there. I, I think I've referenced that chart more times than I like to admit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's funny about that chart, Will, is I did not create it. I actually borrowed it from a one of the uh, online outfits that sells kegs, uh, and we link. They let me borrow it for in exchange for a link back to their website. So I, there was no need for me. You know, why, why fix something that's not broken? I, I took their chart. But yes, like you said, the, a keg needs to have the ability to hold pressure if you are going to force carbonate, or even if you're going to naturally carbonate by the same way you would bottle condition by adding some dextrose or sucrose to the keg uh, to have the the yeast referment that, and then you need it to hold pressure so that that CO two absorbs into the beer. Uh, the, again, uh, the kegs come in these different, uh, these different materials, uh, but they all work on the same, they all work on the same way. They need to hold this pressure. The gas flows in to the keg, uh, CO2 gets absorbed into the beer. And then once you're ready to serve that, you, you, most of the time you're going to purge that gas out. Otherwise you're going to be blowing beer out of your tap. Uh, and then you set it to serving pressure, whatever that may be, which is dependent on your line length. Uh, and then it pushes that the CO2 will put, then push the beer out once you open a valve or your, what we call a faucet. Now on the commercial scale, kegs come in various sizes ranging from six stools, which hold a sixth of a barrel, which is just over five gallons or 20 liters to your standard half barrel kegs. If you've been to college, college or been to a college party, you no doubt have seen these types of kegs, though as a listener of this show, I'm sure you know exactly what we're talking about. Um, and again, there's like four or five, I think there's four or five different keg sizes in between there. On the homebrew scale, as we know very well, Will, the standard is the Cornelius keg, uh, which are often repurposed soda kegs. Uh, the, this is before soda syrup was packaged in boxes and then blended with carbonated water at the Taco Bell, basically. Uh, and these, these come in various sizes as well one, two, three, five, and six gallon. I know that there are some manufacturers out there who are producing brand new corny kegs in different, uh, we'll call them varieties. They look a little different. I'm currently rocking the torpedo kegs from more beer and those are awesome. They have uh, a slim line ball lock one. So it's yeah, it just slimmer. So you can fit more in your kegerator. At least that's how it works for me. Uh, now, when it comes to corny kegs, you've got two basic types, ball lock and pin lock. Which ones do you use? Will? Um, I actually have a combo loco because I started off with pin lock and uh, what I eventually ended up doing so I didn't have to just go out and buy all new kegs is, uh, is I converted over to ball lock kegs, which I think ball lock is Pepsi and pin lock is Coca-Cola, if memory serves. Um, but I, I basically, as I transitioned to ball lock, I basically re replaced the posts on mine. And so I have kind of a hodgepodge. And in my kegerator setup, it makes sense if I have two of the ball locks in the front of mine, which are a little bit taller and skinnier. Yeah. And then the pin locks in the back, which are shorter and squattier, it like actually fits better inside of my kegerator configuration. Yeah, I started off with pin lock, all pin lock, and I think I had like 16 pin lock kegs. And then about three or four years ago, I went through this whole garage revamp, brewery revamp, and I sold my seven tap keyser, built a brand new three tap kegerator, which you can read about all of that stuff on the on, on the website. Uh, but I went from pin lock to ball lock only because I wanted these kind of taller, slim uh, uh, torpedo kegs because they would they fit in my kegerator more. I couldn't fit three pin locks. So I think the decision on, on which one of those to choose for most people really is more function over form, right? You want to see uh, what fits, what works best for you. They do require different disconnects though. Either way, uh, there are a little bit of differences, but ultimately they're basically the same. The differences are just in the disconnects and they operate on the same exact, uh, in the same exact way that, that uh, your standard Sankey kegs operate. That pressure goes in and it pushes beer out. Now let's Let's be again, we're going to get into the whole PET thing here in a minute, because I think there's a lot when it comes to the different materials that can be used or that are being used now to make kegs. But let's talk a, li a little bit about some pros and cons of kegging in general. Well, I would say one big pro, um, which is arguable, but is that I find it to be easier than bottling. I often joke around about how if it was electric all in one systems and kegging that's kept me in this hobby, uh, mostly the kegging part because you're cleaning one verse vessel versus 48 to 50 vessels. <laughs> and so to me that that math just makes sense. Although I understand if you're doing small batch brewing that that number comes a lot 
closer in that Delta strengths. Yeah, um, I, I, man, I couldn't agree with you more. That, that, that I think there's a lot of people out there who uh, who had the same experience that 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 you know maybe they were on, on the verge of not brewing anymore just because the bottling process is so laborious. Uh, moving to kegging, I mean, you're cleaning one vessel that is also easier to clean because you can stick your arm down into it, get make sure that it's totally clean rather than having to clean fi- you know 48 to 52 bottles, individual bottles, and then tr- and you know and then racking the beer into a bottling bucket. One of the other big things about it is that it reduces the risk of cold side oxidation. It's a lot easier. I guess you can have a lot more confidence knowing that the beer going into a keg has not been exposed to oxygen as opposed to, you know, bottling, which there's going to be some level of oxygen exposure. So that's one of the other benefits. And then obviously I think, I think probably the biggest benefit for me besides being a little bit easier than bottling is that you can start drinking that beer about two to two to three days later, even sooner if you're like me, uh, because forced carbonation just happens so much faster than natural carbonation. I mean, I'm sure everyone's had the experience where when you first started bottling beer that you like taste the sample that you're taking as your like final gravity sample and it tastes great. And then you put it in a bottle and add some sugar and suddenly a week later it tastes like garbage because it's still <laughs> in the middle of that re-fermentation. And so to me, this really, uh, that was another big selling point is like I have this, you know, pale ale. It doesn't need to bottle condition for three weeks for me to drink it. I can drink it in two days. Right. So why not? Yeah, and if you're and if you're like me, if you're crazy enough to you know dose your beer with gelatin in the fermentation vessel, and you've got a valve that rests above that true blind, you're actually able to keg really clear beer. So all it needs is carbonation. I know a lot of people will complain about carbonic bite. I've not gotten that in any of my beers. Maybe I'm just not sensitive to it. Which, if that's the case, I'm glad. Uh, but I can I can if I'm burst carbonating, you know, at 50 psi for 12 hours and then knocking that down to 14 psi to serve. I, I'm drinking beers within you know 50. 15 to 20 hours after kegging them as opposed to three to four weeks after bottling them. So that's a huge one. Also, it's just badass to serve homebrewed beer uh, off of a tap at your house. I mean, I think that's a big benefit as well. The excitement, the very first time I had seven beers on tap in my house and we had a party was like, wow, this, it does. It feels like you're, you're kind of rocking your own little pub at home. It, it's amazing. Uh, and at the end of the night when everybody just wants a half a beer and you have a half a beer about seven, eight times, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling. <laughs> We've all done it. <laughs> there's are- just a half beer. Your half beer. Yeah, just okay, half another beer. half. It's yeah, good. Yeah. It's good. I'll take four more halves. Just serve them in the same glass, please. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. It's it's just awesome. You, your ability to adjust how much you're serving. Oh, another note that I think of that, that I think is a really big benefit to uh, to kegging is that if let's say you're drinking your beer and you're like this just needs something else, whether it's an additional dry hop, some some uh, maybe a little bit of gypsum to crisp up the, the the profile of the beer. If you're really safe, not to get you know not to expose the beer to oxygen, you do have the ability to batch, to change the entire batch at once just by adding something to the keg. It's not something I've done often, but I have absolutely done it before. Even with a gelatin finding, oh, this beer is just not clearing up. Let's add a dose of gelatin to the keg. You very, very gently do that. Three days later, the whole beer is now clear. I just think it's really cool. Now, kegging does not come without its cons, of course. I think the biggest one is the fact that it does cost a little bit of money. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not a cheap thing to move into. You have to buy something to hold the kegs, a refrigerator or a freezer, a deep freezer uh, that is controlled with an external controller. Uh, those aren't cheap. You know, I found my first one on Craigslist. I think I got it for 120 bucks. And even then I'm going, man, already that's just the freezer. You got to buy faucets and beer line and a CO2 tank, all of that stuff, a distributor. So it's not a cheap thing to get into. Uh, I think that's the biggest drawback to getting into kegging, but there are a few more cons. Yeah, the cost of entry is definitely the biggest drawback. I would also say like transporting beer, like when it's in a bottle, it's just natural to grab a six pack and take yeah. it down the road and over to a friend's house. Um, unless you have fancy swing tops, then it's a little painful if you have to leave some behind. But <laughs> uh, but but aside from that, it's like, how do you take these small volumes without introducing a little bit of C, a little bit of oxygen into it and, and risk oxidizing your beer? Because I think we've all experienced that filling a growler. You get to the brew club meeting and then for some reason it doesn't taste quite as fresh as you thought it did coming off the tap. And so that's one of those kind of small drawbacks that you you sacrifice for the ease of kegging. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm not sure how long it takes for oxidation to happen, for it to kick in. But I have I have some experiences with bottling off of or packaging off of the tap, off of the keg uh, that have been really, it's kind of up in the air. I'm going, all right, I, I packaged this one three hours ago. It tastes exactly like it does or how I remember it at least off the tap. And then I packaged this one seven hours ago and it's already turning color and it tastes awful. So is it somewhere between that 
that three to seven hour mark where oxidation happens or is it style dependent? Who really knows? But it is something that's one of the things that you have to come up, come up with a solution with. I love the fact that uh, these these home canners are becoming popular because that's a really good way. You know, you fill it up to the top, cap on foam, seam it, and then you can take it with you. And it's really not that difficult. But it is a, it is an issue that you have to consider. Other than that, I don't really see too many drawbacks. It, it, cost of entry is a bit much. You have to figure out ways to transport beer. I know a lot of people who just get smaller kegs and they'll uh, put a jumper between their main keg into the smaller keg. So they're only getting the clear beer, the stuff that you want to drink into the keg. And then they take that with them on the road. I've done that a few times. Uh, so there are workarounds to this stuff. But uh, all in all, I think kegging is really cool. Now, for the most part, as we talked about earlier, kegs have been made of stainless steel. And for good reason. These are impermeable, impermeable to oxygen. So oxygen is not going to get in unless you've got a leak in a seal somewhere. But usually, even if there's a small leak, the positive pressure of the CO2 that you're putting on the keg will make it such that oxygen does not uh, get exposed to the beer. Obviously, if you have a leak, you want to fix that. Uh, they are impermeable to light. So no light's going to be getting in there and skunking your beer. They're easy to clean. They're easy to sanitize. And they're incredibly durable. There's a reason we're using old soda kegs from the 1980s pizza parlors is because they're still good to go because they're made of stainless steel. Right. I at least have multiple kegs that I looked at last night while I was brewing that said Pepsi and Coca-Cola on the side. So if they weren't durable, they, they wouldn't still be around. And you can still go to Adventures in Home Brewing and buy used kegs off of them for, for pretty cheap. Yeah, I think I actually think most online shops have a, a decent amount of used kegs. I would have thought by now, man, we, ha, homebrewers had to have bought all these things up. Apparently, there are just mountains of these kegs somewhere uh, that people are, are buying from. Now, ball lock kegs are going to be a little bit more expensive than than pin lock just because they're more popular. But, but yeah, stainless steel. There's a lot of good reasons to use this. But I would say now this is just what I've noticed that over the last uh, five or six years or so, I've started to notice this increase in non stainless stainless steel options for kegs. Uh, the first time I saw anything that wasn't stainless for a keg was at House of Pendragon before their tap room here in Clovis closed. Uh, Tommy was kegging in these six stools that were made of a black plastic sort of thing. And I'm not, I, th I thought it was HDPE, but I'm not entirely sure what exactly it is, but it looked like rubber, right? Cause it's black. Uh, and they're super strong, way light, way lighter than a stainless steel keg. Uh, but I drank a lot of beer out of those and I never noticed any issues. So it, it said to me that obviously, you know, commercial brewers, of, uh, of worth are going to be minding their oxidation or their packaging process to reduce oxidation. So I never picked up any oxidation in any of his beers, but I also didn't get any other issues, which said to me that these are at least as good for serving, at least when not comparing as the stainless steel, uh, you know, Sankey kegs. Uh, well, I know when I first saw polyurethane as packaging, it was more in line with like the Mr. Beer kits where they had the polyurethane bottles. Sure. And, and I always thought it was pretty cool because it's lighter. It's uh, they're still brown and don't let UV light in. But you always worry about that kind of oxygen permeability of, of polyurethane specifically. And so um, but but obviously, if, if they're using it on that level, it can't be that much of a concern. Yeah, that's exactly my thought as well. Now, the most common thermoplastic polymer resin of the polyester family is what is referred to as polyethylene. Let's see if I can get this terephthalate, also known as PET. I'm probably going to say PET at some point, but, but PET, polyurethane terephthalate, is the most common thermoplastic polymer resin of the polyester, uh, polyester family. And it is one of the most commonly used products by Americans, at least, and probably around the world uh, for beverage containers. I believe something like 30 plus percent of all PET that is made is going into the beverage uh, market uh, as containers for beverages. Now, now, when I was over, I think it was 2017 that I went over to Australia and New Zealand for the their their home brewers conference in New Zealand. And in both of those countries, you can go into a market and buy beer packaged in a PET bottle. I've never seen that here in the States. Perhaps you have, Will, but the beer, I, that was like the main way to buy single use or single packaged beers, right? You want, oh, I just want a couple of bottles of this. I want to try this. They definitely add glass. Don't get me wrong, but there was a ton of these PET bottles and they looked a lot like the bottles you get from uh, you know, your Mr. Beer Kit or whatever it is. They have slightly larger ones as well. I think they're like 20 ounces um, or 720 liters as it were, or a milliliters, but I, the, they're everywhere and I bought a a lot of them and I drink them and I didn't notice any issues. I've had issues packaging in PET bottles and it's probably because I suck at packaging in bottles, but, but I, I was 
kind of blown away that these these beers that had dates, you know, packaging dates on them of three to four weeks prior to me drinking them uh, in New Zealand and Australia tasted great out of a PET bottle. Well, like I said, the, the only place I've seen in the States is like a Mr. Beer Kit. So they're just really not that common here. When, whenever I first got started 11 years ago, it's the same time my buddy Trace got his Mr. Beer Kit and he was kind of, you know, around the corner from me. And um, and I was using all this glass, and he's over there making a Mexican lager from Mr. Beer in a, a plastic <laughs> bottle. And I said, man, that, that's pretty rad. I don't have to worry about it breaking, or even if it does blow up in my bottle conditioning, at least it's it's just a wet mess instead of a glassy wet mess. So I, I see that there's a lot of benefit in this, especially uh, packaging and moving stuff around. But um, but even in Europe and Germany, I, again, glass was king and then cans after that. So it, it's really, um, I'm not sure what's going on in Australia, but they're innovating enough stuff that keep going, guys. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty awesome what y'all do down there. I know the, the influence that they've had on the beer and brewing community has been wild. I mean, you think about brewing a bag, you think about all kinds of stuff. They, they It's awesome. And and what it could be, I mean, Kegland, I believe, is an Australian company, right? Australian or New Zealand, I forget. Uh, Kegland's Australian and they've, they're have they pushing this uh, Ox Bar Mono PET keg and that's that's, that's really now that it's come over here in places like more beer distributing it, that's really gained a lot of popularity amongst home brewers, uh, especially small batch home brewers. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing is that is that the sizing of these PET kegs is a bit smaller than your typical corny keg, which that's fine. Uh, but one of the one of the thoughts that I had, I remember back this must have been over 10 years ago now. Uh, I had I was using these eight gallon buckets, fermentation buckets. I, bu- I bought the eight gallon ones because like most home brewers, I hated cleaning up blow offs. Right. Uh, and and I, I thought, man, eight gallons is way better than a six gallon carboy or a six gallon bucket, whatever it is. I've got two extra gallons of headspace and they worked beautiful for that reason. Now, those are HDPE fermentation buckets. I never had any issues of like plastic tasting beer fermenting in those, but I came home from a trip one time. I had two beers fermenting in my firm chamber and both of the valves on my buckets were moldy. They had developed this mold on them and it pissed me off. I kegged the beers up. Thankfully, the mold was isolated to the outside of the bucket. I drank the beers. I'm still alive. It didn't make me sick or anything like that. But I did I did like a whole Seinfeld move where I was throwing the buckets around once they were empty, like trying to take my moldy anger out on them. And once those were in the garbage, <laughs> I went to more beer and I bought a bunch of, I think about six PET carboys. These are six gallon carboys that are made of a clear non-brown, uh, you know, PET plastic. And when I told my buddies about this, they were like, whoa, the oxygen permeability on that is going to be crap. You're going to have oxidized beer. This is not going to be good. I still use those the same exact carboys. They're durable. I'll tell you what. Uh, for w- whenever I make cider or anything where I'm d- that I'm dosing with fruit, uh, because it's easier to rack off the top of that than it is to have a valve on the bottom. I use my stainless steel fermenters for everything else. But my experience with those PET carboys was so positive that I kind of had a change in heart of of my view of plastic packaging materials as well. So when you had mentioned these Kegland Oxbar PET kegs, will uh, uh, I was pretty stoked to hear about them. Now. The, the one of the things that Kegland says, I don't, I believe, one hundred percent of what they market it as, is that the the PET they used is this blend that is several, it's like several polymers, but uh, it, their purpose in doing that is to make it less impermeable or less permeable to oxygen. So it has three times less gas transmission than normal PET grades of plastic. Meaning, I, I don't know the numbers. I'm not sure we want to go down that path, anyways. But I think that makes it fairly close to the zero uh, permeability of stainless. Um, over time, yeah, you might get a little bit of oxygen permeability, but these kegs, you know, the, what I think the biggest one is is eight liters or two gallons. So you're not, it's not going to be holding beer forever and ever though. Even if it did, I, I just struggle to see how oxygen is going to, is going to get into the, is going to get into the keg. So, so what I read on their website as well is that they, they don't recommend storing it for longer than say six months, which makes it a lot of sense because even at three times less gas transmission, it still probably has more transmission than, say, stainless steel. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. I mean, it, and honestly, outside of a, a big old Russian Imperial Stout or maybe a, a, a Belgian Quad or something, what are you going to be storing for six plus months? For the for the majority of beers most people brew, I mean, you're looking at maybe four weeks. And I get that people make beer and they don't mind having old blonde ale or pale ale or whatever. That's fine if that's you. But I but but again, I think it'd be an interesting experiment to to compare, uh, you know, a, a, a PET keg that that has a beer in it that's aged for six or seven months. But that's neither here nor there for this episode. So uh, now the cool 
thing about these kegs is they're really cheap. They're about a third of the price of stainless alternatives for the same size. So if you're looking at a two gallon corny keg, you're, you're going to pay somewhere up, upwards of like 50 to 60 bucks for that thing. And I think these PED kegs are like $25 will somewhere around that price. So what it is, is if you if you go on more beer today, the keg itself is about ten dollars, but then you have to buy the tapping head. And so um, the, the actual bottle, the, the PET bottle holds about 58 PSI of pressure. Um, and then a corny keg, I think, is just a little over that, depending on what PRV you're using. But then the tapping head, just just word for the wise, has a 35 PSI uh, PRV valve on it. So even though the vessel itself can hold 60 psi the the tapping head that has all your ball lock posts and then it's got the little um dip tube that goes down in the bottom for your liquid uh the prv on that only goes to about 35 36 psi so just just be aware of that if you're into forced carbonation that that's a good point because i read yeah i read that the uh the oxbar kegs can hold up to that they're 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 you're recommended not to go higher than 58 psi which corny kegs you're recommended not to go higher than 60 psi so that's basically the same now obviously i i read somewhere i'm not recommending anybody do this but that most corny kegs are actually pressure tested up to like 120 psi PSI, but you're not going to do that. Even when I'm burst carbonating super fast, I don't go higher than 50 to 55 PSI. Uh, and that's only for 12 hours or so. So keep that in mind. That's good to note on the, on the, uh, the valve part of the Oxbar keg, which I believe everything is proprietary at this point, right? Well, you, if you're going to buy the Oxbar keg, you're buying all the pieces that go to that keg. Right. You're buying the, the, the vessel itself, the bottle, and then you're buying the actual tapping head kit to go along with it. And it's all made by Kegland. It's all proprietary. Um, one of the really cool features of it is that the it's it's kind of a plastic tubing that goes all the way down to this like mesh filter in the bottom. And what's kind of cool is that's weighted. So if you really want to put these things on their side, like in a cooler or in your refrigerator, like if you huh. don't have enough space, it'll actually weight that dip tube down to, you know, close to bottom. And then the, the beauty is, is that if you get down there and there's still liquid and you, you're not pulling anything off the tap anymore, you can just release the PRV valve and go pour a beer straight off the bottle. Oh, yeah. That's a great, yeah, all kinds of cool stuff for using these things. And they're small enough to fit in your fridge. I mean, again, two gallons max. Uh, they, my understanding is they only have four and eight liter options available at this point. Is that right? Uh, that's my understanding as well. And again, for, for a small batch brewer that's only doing like a little stovetop brew in the back, that's the absolute perfect size. Yeah. They're not going to want to go much more than that. And then at $30 for cost of entry to, you know, get into kegging, this is kind of a more economical option than going out and buying a bunch of two or three gallon kegs because a two or three gallon stainless steel keg can run up to a hundred bucks depending on where you're getting it from and used or new. Yeah, exactly. And you can, I mean, you, you think about the small batch brewer. I mean, I, that's kind of the path I'm going down with this, though. I have another use for these types of kegs that I think is what I would use it for. But you think about the small batch brewer who's making, you know, a gallon or two at a time. This is perfect. And you can go buy uh, a, a relatively inexpensive paintball canister for CO2 and get the uh, adapter for that to work with, uh, you know, brewing stuff. And now you're, I mean, you're off to the races for really, I mean, under a hundred bucks, probably, uh, you know, if, if you're cool with just a Cobra tap or something like that, I mean, I think it's a really cool option as well. The other benefit to PET over stainless, and I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people don't care as much about this as I do, but I love being able to see my beer. One of the biggest drawbacks to me moving to stainless fermentation vessels, uh, from the PET carboys was that I can no longer watch the fermentation, the magic of fermentation. So this, this, you get to see your beer, uh, in, you can see how clear it is, right? Cause it's that brown plastic, just like we've all seen with, uh, what is it? A and W root beer bottles, basically, <laughs> or the Mr. Beer bottles. Uh, and also they're easier to travel with. This is what, where I think it comes into, uh, makes is the most interesting aspect to me is if I'm going to a homebrew club meeting or if I'm going to go hang out with with folks or go to a party and I want to take beer that I can serve off the tap being able to to transfer just put a jumper on my regular keg into one of these kegs all closed uh, and then put a tap on it and serve carbonated clear good beer off of one of these two gallon kegs at a party that you're just you know you just have this thing stored in, in an ice chest or something I think that's pretty rad is that something that you've done with your ox bars before uh, will that that's honestly the main reason I got them was to travel with them because let's just face it like taking a five gallon stainless steel keg to a party is kind of a pain and these are a <laughs> lot lighter they fit in my cooler a little better although they are a lot taller than you think they would be they are kind of like a two liter bottle on crack so they are kind of <laughs> tall if you get the two gallon version uh so just just be aware of that um, but they do i have a cooler that's big enough and it lays perfectly on its side in there i can cover it with ice and then run the uh 
picnic tap out the side and, and it, it just works beautifully. So I, I really did get them to travel with. And so it, it's pretty fantastic and they're a lot lighter to carry around, which is the biggest benefit to me. Oh, big time. Now I've never used PE, PET kegs, like I said, but I do have quite a bit of experiments, uh, experience with PET bottles. Uh, I went through this whole phase for about a year where that's all I would use. It wasn't until I was shipping those beers that I packaged in PET bottles and they would, they land, they landed and the person who I sent them to. Thankfully it was just my brother was like, Oh my God, something's wrong with these that I realized there's some issue with my packaging process. I just thought it was the PET bottles cause I've shipped glass many times successfully. Now, uh, those issues aside, I know the, that the kegs that you're using, it sounds like your experience is generally positive, at least in non-comparative analyses, that when you're taking beers with you to friends' houses or to homebrew club meetings, it's actually working out really well with these kegs? It's working out pretty well. There, there are a few things you need to be aware of. I mean, uh, the weirdest thing that you don't think about is that whenever I drain my stainless steel kegs when I clean them, I just flip them upside down and they go all the way out the bottom. Um, but on these, you kind of have to be a little more gentle because if you just flip a soda bottle upside down, it's going to start compressing on top and that compression is going to kind of put um, wrinkles and things. And I, and I kind of worry that maybe if it, if it puts a seam or something somewhere, that could be a vector for infection, which is kind of a weird idiosyncrasy with it. Um, also, all the on the tapping head lid, everything's threaded. And so you don't want to over tighten or under tighten. And so I, I've not my personal experience, but anecdotal on the internet, you can see that people may have over tightened them at times. They're not tightened them enough and that can cause leaking issues on its own. Yeah. Um, so it's, but overall, like if you're just doing split batches and, and as the, the unofficial syrup guy of philosophy, like putting tonics, <laughs> tonic syrup or root beer or whatever else in these things, it's a really great way to make kind of small batches of those kinds of things and just have them on tap as well. Cause there's nothing quite like having a tonic on tap. Oh, <laughs> you're giving me an idea. I love I love uh, gin cocktails. Uh, my my go to is Tom Collins. So there's not any tonic in a Tom Collins, but you could easily make a batch of Tom Collins or kind of a hybrid version. It's supposed to be shaken at the time of serving, yada yada. But can you imagine going with the same ratio, making two gallons of it, carbonating it by itself? You know, just adding water instead of sparkling water, and then carbonating it yourself and serving a Tom Collins off tap. I just think that sounds rad. Well, I love the idea as well of storing bulk beer in a light, more portable keg, but only if it doesn't have a negative impact on the quality of the beer it contains. You were curious how PET kegs compare to stainless kegs and designed an experiment to test it out. We're going to be getting into those results when we're back from this break. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to deltabrewingsystems.com today. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clear wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. Of all of the upgrades and changes I've made since I started brewing, the one that sticks out as being the coolest, to me at least, was switching from bottling to kegging, though it wasn't all flowers and sunshine. Uh, in addition to kegs not being terribly cheap, I had to come up with ways to transport smaller volumes of my beer that didn't ruin the beer. I actually only learned that PET kegs were a thing when you proposed the experiment we're going to talk about now, Will. 
Well, um, it's a lot of guys over at the brew club and, and they were really getting hyped up for these things. Cause a lot of them are small batch brewers that really just, they want to, to have a, an option that didn't involve them having to have these giant five gallon stainless steel kegs around. And this was just an, an easy segue into it. And I, it got me curious as well. So that's why we're doing this experiment. Heck yeah. So how, so how explain to us the process that you went through to brew these beers. I know it was a single batch, single five gallon batch that you ended up splitting in part because the PET kegs are only two gallons. So you didn't need to make two five gallon batches for this one. Right. So this is a single five gallon batch of a simple pale lager on my Robo Brew Brewzilla system. Uh, I used a hundred percent Tex malt Lano Pilsner malt. And we're going to have some discussion on Lano versus Yano because in Texas, we like to very much mispronounce everything and do it with uh, <laughs> force. So, um, so it, it is Lano L L A N O Pilsner malt. Um, they're based out of Fort Worth and they um, get most of their ingredients from my understanding, this one farm up in the panhandle. And so they get most of all their malts from this one farm and they, they put out some really good products up there. So I really appreciate Nick and those guys. Yeah. Total aside, I, this whole crap, craft maltster, maltster movement is just so awesome to me. I mean, I love Vireman and I, I'm, I'm a big fan of RAR and Great Western and all the big malt, you know, producers out there. I've not been able to try Tex Malt. Uh, I know that we've got Martin is, is going to be working with Epiphany Malt and we're trying to, to, to talk more and more about these craft maltsters. So again, it's an aside. We're not paid to talk about this, but I'm really, I'm just proud of the fact that you're using this Tex Malt and that they're so cool with uh, providing that malt for us to use for these experiments. How is that Lano Pilsner? I was calling it Yano Pilsner, but how, how is it? Is it, I mean, I, I imagine it's pretty good. So, so just, just so you know, if you go to, uh, Central West Texas, you might go to the Llano Estacado, but if you go to the city there, you're going to Llano. So, and they're spelled the same. And, and, and if you were, you know, it's just kind of like if we're going up to real ale, we'd be going up to Blanco and not Blanco. So right, just, right. Well, well, again, yeah. we, we like to, we like to mispronounce everything with force and vigor here in Texas. So don't worry about it. Um, but, but no, like, <laughs> I mean, joking aside, it's kind of true, yeah. uh, but no, so, so tech small, these guys are great. Um, uh, I really just appreciate uh, being able to work with it. Um, so far, like the ones that I've really been able to try have been their, uh, their Pilsner malt. They have a wildfire pale malt. They have, um, a malted blue corn, which supposedly their blue corn is the same blue corn that goes to make all the blue corn tortilla chips in the state of Texas. So that's, I, awesome. that, that's, that's pretty, it's the same, same farm. And then they, uh, their Munich malt and then, I think that's most of what I've tried of theirs, but for a base malt, I really do like the flavor it gives me um, compared to some other kind of like uh, macro maltsters. I feel like it gives like kind of a more personal experience. It, it is slightly under modified, but again, like that's, that's great because again, you, you don't want what everyone else is giving you with these craft maltsters. You want yeah. something just a little different, yeah. just a little wrinkle in there. And I do think it definitely provides that for a nice malty backbone in this Pilsner malt. Yeah. And so, uh, and especially these simple ones that are all Pilsner malt. I know with some other macro maltsters, there's like this um, graininess that uh, my wife perceives it as grassy. And, w and, and when I started moving over to this, um, I haven't heard that comment from her yet. Well, so good. that's, that's all. That's a good recommendation for them. So, yeah, awesome. Well, check out Tex Malt if you're around uh, the Texas area, if you want something unique for your beer. Uh, uh, ongoing with the, with the brewing process here, I know that you mash at 153 degrees Fahrenheit or 67C for about an hour. I think that's pretty typical for these, you know, 100% pale malt. This is a pale lager that you're hopping with uh, American hops. Tell us a little bit more about the brewing method. Okay. Yep. So we mashed at 153 or 67 Celsius for one hour. Uh, when the mash dress were complete, removed the grains and sparged to collect pre-boil volumes. Uh, after that, the wort was boiled for 60 minutes. And this was an all Amarillo beer. So we, there was 11 grams of Amarillo at 60 minutes, 10 grams of Amarillo at 30 minutes, 10 grams of Amarillo at five minutes. And I have to say, like, we, we always talk about um, Whirlpool and dry hop and everything else. But, but this... That, that typical kind of uh, tangerine flavor you expect from Amarillo, that citrus, it comes through with absolutely no dry hops and no Whirlpool additions in this beer. It, it's a phenomenal hop. It's one of my favorites. I know it's one of Steve Thanos' favorites too. It's also one of my favorites. It's, it's easily in my top five favorite hops of all time, uh, up there with Tetninger and, and some others, but I love Amarillo. And that's yet another thing that we say differently. I would say, if I'm speaking Spanish, which I'm not terribly good at it, but if I wanted to refer to something that is yellow, 
yellow, I'd say amarillo. Now, my what I was told by somebody in the hop industry is that there there's this intentional pull to call it amarillo for the hop. Now, I don't know how accurate that is. That was one person's thing, and I was corrected. So I, I, I was I was t- I was getting ready to text Martin yesterday and be like, I have an idea for an episode of the Brewlosophy show. We should talk about get pedantic, right? And talk about the way things are pronounced. But but that would be for another episode. But I just thought it was since you are in Texas, Will, I was wondering, you guys refer to the city as as Amarillo. No, it, we refer to it as Amarillo. <laughs> but you're so just in being fact, there's a whole correct. song. You can sing Am I Right or Amarillo? I mean, it's a whole song, Marshall. So really, again, we like to take the thing and it's it's sure it's Spanish in origin, but we like to mispronounce it, but with like really <laughs> big conviction. That's that's our thing. That's our game. I like it. Well, also Amarillo by morning. That's what I that's what I was thinking. So I'm glad that they say it that way as well. I don't know. I, I'm going to ask when next time I go up to, to Yakima for Hop Harvest, I'm going to ask how everyone up there, you know, what they prefer to call Amarillo or Amarillo hops. Anyways, awesome hop. I like the hopping strategy. You're not going overly hoppy here. So any differences shouldn't be covered up by the uh, by the hop profile. Yeah, I think it wound up at about 20 IBUs if I'm if I go back and look at my notes. Um, but anyways, moving on after the boil, the wort was chilled and racked to sanitize fermenter, at which point a refractometer reading was taken and it got an OG of about 1.049, which Beautiful. is pretty nice for a pale lager. Um, I pitched a single pouch of Imperial Yeast L13 Global into the 64 Fahrenheit or 17 C wort. Um, after a week of fermentation at this temperature, hydrometer measurement was taken to show the beer was at about an FG of 1.011, which again is a, a just a lovely, nice pale lager. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing too exciting other than the hop choice, but it, it really does showcase that Amarillo hop. And then the entire batch was pressure transferred to a stainless steel corny keg and burst carbonated overnight before the gas was reduced to serving pressure. Yeah. So let, let's spend a minute talking about this. The The initial uh, packaging process was to a five gallon standard Cornelius keg uh, where the beer was conditioned and carbonated initially. And then after a few days of condition, I, I think in the article you mentioned it was like 12 or 13 days, you transferred half as close as possible as half of that beer over to one of these two gallon or eight liter keg and Oxbar PET kegs, uh, which you then connected to CO2 at the same exact pressure that was already on the stainless keg. And then you let those sit for a period of time. Now, there's always going to be arguments in anything that we do that has a temporal component, a, a component of waiting. People are going to are going to chime in and say, well, you should have waited longer. You should have waited longer. And that's always the case. We chose a specific amount of days as to establish at least the very first, you know, uh, 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 iteration of this comparison. And what was uh, that time, that timeline? Well, so we decided to leave the beers alone for 10 days. And, and like you just said, we sometimes you just have to establish a baseline, right? And so right. You, we could have established a baseline of six months, but then we'd have to be reeling it back to see if there's a difference or, or if there was one. And so it sometimes it just makes more sense to start at 10 days. That way you kind of have an idea of what's going on. And it just establishes a nice baseline of if these things are stored in for say you know some some amount of time will there be a difference in taste right so uh you got those beers all packaged up they'd been sitting there for 10 days the first thing we like to do is get our beady little eyes on these beers and get our tongues on them as well and we do our own evaluation which is not blind we like to semi-blind ourselves meaning we just have either somebody else service the triangle test or we do our own weird routine that i'm not going to go into for the umpteenth time on this episode but where we don't know which beers are in the glasses when we're doing our own triangle test and and that way we when we attempt to do it our bias is only awareness of the variable. It has nothing else to do. Well, and experience with the beers prior, I suppose. But uh, but it has nothing to do with knowing which beer is in the cups. How did you do on your triangle test? And how did these beers look to you in person? Well, the appearance of these beers was was practically identical. Like when you're just looking at them through the glass, they looked exactly the same. Um, and out of my five triangle test attempts, I chose the odd beer out just one time, oh, which man. my wife took great relishing in yeah you suck will (laughs) well i'll tell you what with with the hopping that you did i mean pale lagers aren't in my opinion at least in terms of the color change that we see in hazy ipa pale lagers just not as sensitive to cold side oxidation as as hazy ipa now you took every effort to ensure that beer was not exposed to oxygen you purged the ox bar keg prior to filling it you pressure transferred the beer from the corny keg into the ox bar keg so ostensibly there really was 
a little to no uh, oxygen, oxygen exposure at all. So the fact that these beers looked identical, one of them was not that purplish grayish color that, that you kind of expect from an oxidized beer is a first indicator to me that, okay, this thing is keeping oxygen out. Now, there was positive pressure 100% of the time. We get that. Uh, but at the, at, at the very beginning, at least, when you're pouring these beers for your own evaluations, I saw the photo and they look identical to my eyes. The foam is the same. There was no difference in carbonation, it seemed. Uh, or that's what you reported. There was no difference in, in uh, foam quality, no difference in color. So, so far, we're starting off on a good track, in my opinion. Oh, definitely. It, again, I, I think the right move was to uh, pressurize them in the same keg at first. And then by the time I got them moved over and sitting at the same serving pressure for 10 days, they were basically identical in carbonation, uh, color, everything at that point. And, and like you said, it went into a purged keg. I filled the whole thing up with star sand, pushed it out, just our normal process, just to make sure that we didn't get any oxygen in there. Yeah, no, it's perfect. So then you ultimately ended up serving these beers in triangle test to 28 participants, out of which 15 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us to say with any confidence that there was a, you know, a, a distinguishable uh, difference between these beers, something that made them perceptibly different. Uh, and again, 15 out of 28. We can only say that with some element of confidence, not saying that there is absolutely a difference here. Uh, how many people out of those 28 actually were able to identify the odd beer out? Uh, I believe the actual number of tasters that were able to identify the odd beer out was 11, which means that this was not significant. That's 39%. Now, you have to keep in mind with three cups, the the odds of randomly picking each one of those cups if they're identical beers is 33%. A lot of people like to mistakenly think that it's 50%. That would be if there was two beers. There's three, three cups in front of you, and if they're the identical beer, if there's no differences, then you would expect roughly 33% of tasters to pick each one of those cups. In this case, it was a little higher, 39%. But that is not near, uh, uh, nearly enough to, to achieve this level of significance that allows us, again, to say with some level of confidence that racking it to a PET keg produced a different, perceptibly different characteristic than keeping it in the Cornelius keg, uh, allowing us to, to, to say, it, again, you, you you can't extrapolate much from a, a, a non-significant experiment, but at the very least, these beers were, were good. They didn't seem to have a detrimental impact using the PET keg, and I think that's pretty awesome for people who want to travel uh, with beer, smaller amounts of beer from their Cornelius keg. Uh, and not only that, but traveling, but also just the fact that you know that like PET doesn't put some kind of weird flavor into your beer, right? Because it is a different <laughs> material. We, we, but I'm sure we've all had that experience where we thought the plastic bottled soda tasted different than the canned soda. So it's nice to know that, that that wasn't the case in this particular instance. Yeah. You didn't end up drinking a plasticky pale lager, right? That it didn't taste like plastic, which I mean, P, like I said, PET is being used uh, 30. Uh, that's what I read was 30% plus uh, of all PET produced is being used in the beverage market for, for as a beverage container. So again, this just kind of validates the, the use of it for beer, at least after 10 days, you know, we can only say uh, after 10 days of storage in a cold environment, a pale lager from a PET keg was indistinguishable from one stored in a stainless cornery. I think that's pretty rad. Now, we do have some reader comments to get to. This first one is kind of interesting to me, and, and in, a, in a way, I get it. Um, in another way, I, I'm not sure I do. So I, I'm just going to read the comment, and we'll see what you have to think about it, Will. Uh, Dalwal Shah says, the effects of PET on a beer would be better demonstrated under a microscope. Millions of particles of microplastic get mixed with the beer, which may not affect the taste, but definitely your body internally. So I am not very fluent in the research of microplastics and their effect on the human body. I would assume that at some level we are consuming plastic, and I, I think I've read something to that effect. Um, but obviously, if we, it's still allowed to happen. So um, either there's a massive conspiracy out there, or it, it's relatively safe to drink. <laughs> yeah, that you, I think you and I are kind of on the same page. I get the concern, it, which is odd. I, I I do get it. Like. I've read some some articles and whatnot on microplastics and the negative impact they can have on one's health. But at the same time, perhaps foolishly, uh, 
I kind of trust that that the widespread use of PET uh, and the research that has gone into it and and the fact that we're able to access it the way that we do sends the message that it's it's not as detrimental at the very least it's not as detrimental perhaps not detrimental at all for use in this capacity now Dawal maybe you know something that we don't uh, maybe you've read some research that we don't have access to or haven't seen uh, and I'd be interested to hear more about that but in the case of using you know an eight liter PET keg from Kegland the ox bar keg for uh, the purposes of transporting beer or even storing beer in your fridge for you know two to three months max. I'm not sure I would be terribly concerned by that, but but again, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I do understand why people might, and 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 in that case, spend a little bit more money, get your uh, get your stainless steel keg because we know how how effective those are. So. Next comment comes from Daniel E. Johnson. He says, I have an Oxbar keg and the issue I'm having is that the keg doesn't do a great job at holding pressure. Even when all the fittings are securely tightened and checked with star sand for leaks, I'm not sure if CO2 is diffusing out through the plastic or the disconnects. <laughs> Curious if you've come across this issue and I'm not sure I'd be happy serving from this keg if it's slowly losing CO2. Uh, the tank would be gone quickly. At least it would be good for bottling vessel. So... I don't know that that's been my experience so far. I haven't really had any issues necessarily with um, it losing pressure. I I guess I had one when I put put the tapping head together the first time on one of them. I usually do a pressure check and there was some hissing coming out of one of the connections on the tapping head. But again, those those they're threaded fittings for those ball lock connectors. And just another thing to warn about, like they're they're universal fittings, so you can totally hook your liquid into your gas and vice versa, which is a great way to make a, a nasty mess. Um, but w- those threads, you just make sure you tighten those down adequately. And I've not had any issues, but who knows? Maybe it's plastic. Maybe something got warped. Maybe something happened during shipping. Uh, I would reach out to whoever you purchase them from. I know more beer is usually really receptive to getting feedback like that yeah. and making making uh, wrongs right. Well, when you you mentioned earlier about possibly, uh, you know, screwing up the threads by over tightening, uh, maybe when I read Daniel's uh, comment, that's what I thought of is maybe he over tightened it and it created a little uh, mist thread. And now that that's leaking CO2, I am highly, highly, highly doubtful that your the actual plastic is in some way seeping out CO2. I don't think that's possible, actually. Uh, even standard PET, your soda bottle PET, you can blow those things up like a bomb with CO2, and it's going to contain that CO2. If it's slowly diffusing out, it's so slow that it's you're not going to notice it. That That's my hunch on that one. So I think that, Daniel, you've probably got a leak somewhere in, in, the, in the non- keg part of uh, the of the ox bar that you're using somewhere in the valve or something like that. So take a look at that. Hopefully you get it figured out. But Will, that is all I've got on storing a pail lager and transporting it at least in a PET keg. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap things up? I think there's a lot of really cool things we can do with the future in this. Like even if we did the same time frame with just a different style, like hazy IPA, which we know is more sensitive to certain things. Like I would really be curious to see uh, how far we can take this. Even even traveling, what does it do in the back of a cooler in my back of my truck in a cooler for a week? That would be um, pretty amazing stuff to explore. So I look forward to exploring this topic a little further. Yeah, I, I just give massive kudos to the companies out there who are producing these types of solutions for that that are relatively inexpensive that can really just make certain aspects of, of brewing and, and sharing beer easier. So kudos to Kegland for that. This was not a paid episode. I know we talked specifically about Kegland. The only reason we did that is because as far as we know, they're the only ones making these, these kegs and we did the experiment. So uh, again, kudos to Kegland for making these ox bars. Go to morebeer.com if you're interested in looking at them. You can use our link at uh, brewlosophy.com slash support and we get a little kickback if you end up buying one of those kegs. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Brew Lab podcast where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go.